Steps, promoting patient safety, improving health. I'm Adam Hoffman of West Virginia Steps, West Virginia University, and this is Stop the Bleed. Stop the Bleed is a, was designed by the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma in cooperation with the American Colleges of Emergency Physicians, NAEMT, and TCCC, and is presented here by West Virginia Steps. This is not designed to be an encompassing course. This is the didactic version, uh, which should have an accompanying in-person practical portion as well. Disclosure, some of the images during this presentation may, did, may be found disturbing by some people. There are images of bleeding and wound care here. So why do you need this training? Well, the number one cause of preventable death from injury is massive bleeding. And this is completely preventable. So with a little bit of education and a few tools, we can all stop the bleed. So where can we use this training? Well, we, a lot of publicity in for mass shootings and terrorist events, but truly massive bleeding occurs most commonly at home or in common activities, right? Like car accidents uh, or broken glass in the home, uh, lawnmower injuries or firearm injuries at the home. So this training is designed to help you in all of those situations, including mass shooting events or terrorism events as well. So our goals of this training are to help you identify life-threatening bleeding, and then take steps to stop that bleeding and save a life. So as always, remember your safety is the most important. So if you're injured, you can't help anybody else and you only make a problem worse. So only help if it's safe for you to do so and it always be reassessing the situation in the scene to make sure that the, it is still safe for you to provide that care. So if you can, if the scene is not safe, the situation is putting you in jeopardy, stop what you're doing, move to safety, and ideally, if you can, take the victim with you. Wear gloves if you can, and if you get blood on you, make sure you wash your hands thoroughly or any area that was contaminated with blood um, thoroughly for at least 20 seconds with soap and water as soon as, as soon as practical. And then tell a healthcare provider if you have, you've got blood on you and follow their directions. Getting blood on your skin is a very low risk for transmission of communicable disease as long as you wash it. So don't be scared to provide aid to someone, even if you don't have gloves available to you. So here are the ABCs of bleeding control. So the first step is alert 911. You need to get help coming to you. Uh, trauma is a surgical emergency and requires a surgical intervention. So get help coming as soon as you can, ideally. Uh, and then you know, identify that bleeding and compress the site. Those are the three, the big three. So for alert 911, no where, you're, where you are, be able to give the dispatcher good information on where to find you, uh, whether that's a physical address or directions to where you are, and then you know, follow any instructions provided by the dispatcher while you're helping. If you can, if you're calling from a cell phone, put it on speaker so that you can be helping the victim and talking to the 911 operator at the same time. Don't hang up until they tell you to, uh, and they have all the information they need. So the next is identifying ma major bleeding. So look for sources of bleeding, continuous bleeding, large volumes of bleeding, right? So we're looking, we're not talking about scratches and small cuts. We're talking about massive hemorrhage and generally accompanying pooling of blood. So these are major vessels spurting like from an artery um, and, and those uh, massive bleeding types. Don't forget too that just because you found one source of bleeding doesn't mean the patient doesn't have another source as well. So make sure you examine them and you find all the sources of bleeding. Clothing can hide bleeding, especially thick winter clothing it can hide that and contain that bleeding to where you may not be able to see it pulling on the outside. So we're going to be talking about bleeding in the arms and legs, in the groin, axilla, and neck. And then of course, it can still happen. Major bleeding can happen in the body. So for the purpose of this course, uh, we're going to break that down into those three categories. Your interventions will be slightly different. So remember, arms and legs, uh, very easy. Direct pressure, tourniquets are applicable here. The groins, axilla, and neck, major blood vessels around there can be cause major bleeding. Uh, in the body, there are some things you can do, but the internal bleeding can only be stopped with surgical intervention. So it's not um, going to be as effective trying to stop bleeding in the core, certainly in the chest. 
So the first thing I want you to know is direct pressure. Apply pressure to the wound, ideally with the gloved hand, but even with a bare hand, put pressure on it. And then you want to put direct pressure directly on where the blood is coming from. Uh, if you have clean gauze, sterile gauze, that's ideal, but any clean, any clean cloth will work to, to help you put pressure on the wound. Push on the wound until the bleeding stops and then keep pushing until help arrives. So here's a video uh, of, of a person applying direct pressure and using a clean t-shirt in this case. So she's identifying the location of a gunshot wound. And we're gonna grab our clean cloth here and just put it over the wound and stack up a couple of layers and then apply significant direct pressure onto the wound. So if that, if that does not stop the bleeding and the wound is particularly deep, you may need to pack the wound. And, and all that means is to, to put gauze inside the wound to help you tampen on the bleeding from the outside. So ideally, sterile gauze or combat gauze, which is laced with a hemostatic agent, should be used. But any clean cloth will work for this. So we want to shove that down into the wound and then put pressure on top. So here's a demonstration. In this example, the woman has a quick clot gauze, which is a, laced with a hemostatic agent. So she removed the gauze from the package. And then we're going to find the site of the wound. And then all you're going to do is take that and push it in the hole. So hemostatic gauze is coated with a material that promotes blood clotting. So it's the best to use. And if you have hemostatic gauze, it's ideal. If you don't, any clean cloth will do in this case. Uh, so fill the wound up as much as you can until you can't fit any more cloth into the wound and then take the remainder and put it on top and apply direct pressure. So you can pack wounds in the arms and legs in the joint spaces like the axilla and the groin. You can sometimes pack those wounds as well. And in some areas of the body you can, but generally speaking in the body, you're not gonna be able to pack those wounds. You're not gonna be able to get enough uh, gauze into the wound to be able to pack it, right? So internal abdominal bleeding, you're not going to stop with wound packing and certainly nothing in the chest or the neck. So remember, we wanna pack wounds that, um, you pack any wound that's bleeding externally, but do not occlude, be careful in the neck area so that you don't occlude their airflow. Um, and in the groin and axilla is a great place for this. So the last thing we're gonna talk about are tourniquet application. So tourniquets go two to three inches above the wound. It can't put them over a joint, and then you're going to tighten it until it stops. Right? So one of the common questions we hear that tourniquets are a life or limb, right? and that's simply not true anymore. Tourniquet application has been shown to be safe for at least six hours. So they have six hours to get that off at the hospital which is a very long time in this, in this situation. So don't be afraid of the person losing their limb because you're applying a tourniquet. They're much more likely to die from blood loss than they are from, their, from the tourniquet itself. So two to three inches above the wound and you're going to tighten it until the bleeding stops. You can apply it to yourself or others. Um, it can go over clothes, although thick winter clothing, if you can efficiently remove it, that would be ideal. Tourniquet should hurt. This should be very painful. Maybe not as painful as the wound, but it should definitely be very painful. If it's not painful, you probably haven't tightened it tight enough. And then in major cases of bleeding, femoral arteries and, and the like, you may need to reply a second tourniquet above the site of the first tourniquet. So here's a video of tourniquet application. So in this case, we're applying it to the upper arm. So you're gonna wrap the tourniquet around and you're gonna feed the loose end through the buckle. So to do that, you want to pull it pretty tight from the beginning, and then it will Velcro to itself. The stick that's on the tourniquet is called a windlass, and that windlass applies a mechanical advantage that you simply can't get just by pulling on the tourniquet itself. So a mechanical advantage will allow you to tighten it tight enough so that it will stop the blood flow. So that's a key to tourniquet application is to have a windlass. And then the white strip simply goes across like that to hold the windlass and all of that in place. And then it's got a place to have the time written on it. And you want to apply the time so that the surgeons at the hospital know when that was applied and they know when their clock is to get it off again. So no permanent damage occurs to the limb.
So here's some examples of commercially available tourniquets. Um, there's a CAT and a soft T, TX2 and TX3. All of these are approved and are good tourniquets. They're available commercially online or anywhere that you get first aid supplies. It's good to keep one in your vehicle, one in your home. So here's some recommended non-pneumatic tourniquets, the, the CAT Gen 6 and CAT Gen 7, uh, TX2, TX3. All of these are great, are good tourniquets that are effective and been shown effective. Pneumatic limb tourniquets we haven't talked about, but here's some examples of pneumatic limb tourniquets as well. So bleeding control in children, the only difference here really is that in very small children, you may not be able to use the tourniquet, but all of the other skills apply and they will all work. Uh, so, but in the children that are too small to use a tourniquet, direct pressure almost always works in, those, in, those, in that population. So if, you, if the tourniquet's too big to apply to children, uh, just use direct pressure and wound packing. That will you know, almost always stop the, the major bleeding. All right, so frequently asked questions. What about impaled objects? So if you have an impaled object, don't remove it. The impaled object may be tamponading internal bleeding that will become much worse if you remove the object. So unless it's occluding the patient's ability to breathe, don't remove the impaled object. Improvised tourniquets. So this is a good one. If you have, you can make a tourniquet out of almost anything. So a belt, a, a triangular bandage, a, a piece of cloth or a, a piece of rope. But the key is to find a windlass. So you need a stick or a strong ink pen, anything that you can insert through this. You want to tie it around the limb, tie it tight and put a stick in it and tighten that stick. You need that mechanical advantage to be able to get it tight enough to stop the bleeding. As we talked about before, you're not going to cause the loss of a limb here. Uh, you have multiple hours to get these tourniquets off again, uh, which can be done in the hospital. So you're much more likely to die from the mass of bleeding than you are to lose a limb from the tourniquet. But even if you did lose the limb, that's still better than dying from the blood loss. This should hurt. This, should, this is painful and this should hurt. And if it, if it isn't painful for the patient, you probably haven't applied the tourniquet tight enough. Uh, but even direct pressure and wound packing are painful procedures. But remember here, the goal is to stop life-threatening bleeding. So they, hopefully, I'm sure they'll thank you. thank you later on. So in summary, make sure that you're mindful of your own safety. Get help coming to you as quickly as you can. Identify that life-threatening bleeding. And then compress with pressure and wound packing. Tourniquet if you can, if you have it. And then stay with the patient and continue those interventions until help arrives. For more information, you can visit bleedingcontrol.org or stopthebleed.org. And thank you.